down the hammer and pick up the pencil. You're about to listen to the Savvy Radio Show. Learn from real life real estate investors. Experience revealed with the Savvy Landlord as your host. All right, welcome everybody to Playing Full Out. I'm your host, Augie Bylot, and this is where we explore success, fulfillment, and the power of purpose. And each week, we visit with interesting people who not only make money, but make a difference. And this is where we spread the good news about enlightened wealth, success that serves others. And this week's special guest is my very, very good and dear friend, Stephen Van Kallenberg. Steve, how are you doing? Yay. I Man, it, it's an honor to be a, a your guest because I had to connive and get my, my hands uh, through other people to get to you. And it's cool to be... I guess for you, because I, I want it, I want you to be my guest. <laughs> well, anytime, you know that, my friend. Yes, you're gracious with your time and your knowledge and your your gifts and talents, and uh, you've you've done a great thing. It impacted my world. I, I'm an investor in my market just bought two wheelchairs. Uh, phenomenal. Um, so it's an honor. I'm excited. Let's let's get it on. Okay, let's get it on. So I know you're in the middle of a couple of big deals mm-hmm. and you know, a lot of people don't know your background, but you are a legitimate rags to riches story. I mean, yes, they have been some powerful forces working in your life. Mm. You want to share yes. a little bit about that background? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, real fast. I was uh, born in 1973. So I'm 46 years old today. I uh, <laughs> grew up with us, not today, but um, <laughs> as of this interview, <laughs> I uh, had a single mom. My dad left when I was around two. My brother is six years older than me, and he uh, was really frustrated that I was born. And the reason why I was born, that's why my dad left. That's not true, but my poor brother felt that way. He was out of control. My mom had to make the ultimate choice. Can't imagine that she had to put my brother up to a foster home. And uh, we were in New Jersey, and then uh, it was a rough single mom lifestyle. And then one day my mom did the Karate Kid and I, they wouldn't let me out of, uh, I was in special, a lot of people don't know this, so this would be cool. Um, I was behind in reading for about six years. What happened was I was I had behavioral issues. Um, back then they didn't call it ADD. They would uh, medicate me with Ritalin and whatever. And I would just, people would make fun of me um, and I would lash out. And I was a very large boy. And so eventually I got kicked out of school, elementary school. And then I had to go get bused in a small bus to a smaller school for behavioral problems. I was there for a long time. And then one day I tried to get out of that school. And I was a little smart for my age because I kind of, I didn't understand. I I was like, hey, um, I want to be mainstream back into regular school. And they're like, uh, one more year next year. And then I realized they kept delaying it. And I was young. I was like, you know, 10, 11, 12 at the time. And they, I realized I was just a number in the school system. In this special school, they got paid per child. And in New Jersey, you had to go to school. You can't do homeschool. It was a law. And so my mom did another unsacrificing thing. We packed everything and we moved to California because the school would not let me mainstream. And this is cool before the internet. And for some miracle reason, they lost my um, jacket, my file that went with me as a behavioral child. So we landed in San Diego in Imperial Beach, California. And uh, my mom couldn't find a job. I finally got back into school because we didn't have any paperwork because we mystically lost it. And I got straight A's and I had no behavioral problems. Interesting. But I still was about several years behind but I worked really hard to overcome that learning disability. And then when we fell on hard times, uh, we were living, we had no furniture Our house got kit. We were living on the border of Tijuana and my mom had to do the next unbelievable thing. She had to call my dad and say, Hey, we're, we are on welfare or we were about to get on welfare. We can't pay the rent. We have no place to go. And so I was around 15 ish. Um, we moved to San Francisco, the Bay area. And I met my uh, dad. It was like the second time I ever met that dude who, uh, you know, we can spend a whole episode on that guy. So he owned a construction company at the time, which is fascinating. And so I got stuck there with him. My brother was in the foster home still. I think he graduated by then and he uh, went into the military to, as a Navy man. 
And I went to uh, high school. Um, again, my paperwork got lost, but they let me enroll. And eventually my, my paperwork did get found and they let me go. And I went to a public school there. And then one day I was in gym class and uh, this guy rolls up to me. He's like, you want to go to church? And I was like, what? Church? And uh, sure, there's ladies there. And I, that's how I came to know Jesus as my Savior, July 29th, 1991. And that day forward, so you got to kind of keep perspective. Single mom worked three jobs. My mom worked, uh, delivered newspapers, worked a regular job, and then worked a, a restaurant job at night. Sometimes she worked all weekend. So I never saw my mom. I, you know, I try to tell, tell my own children that my mom never saw me play a sport at all, never saw an, uh, a school activity. She was always working. If she wasn't working, she was sleeping. We lived in a one-bedroom apartment my whole life. My only dream at that time was to live in a house. So when I came to know Jesus, my youth minister, she was amazing. And she's like, hey, why don't you go to OBU? I'm like, what's that? Oklahoma Baptist University at the time. I didn't even know what Baptist meant. So long story short, my youth minister, she's incredible. She drove me from San Francisco to spring break to visit the campus. And that's how I got to Oklahoma. And then I was, my dream was uh, to own a business and to own, live in a house. So in 1996, I left OBU, dropped out, couldn't afford it. It was a struggle. School was a struggle. Life was a struggle, but I wanted to be in business. So I was operating a DJ slash music production company, and I was doing my own events. I was a hustler. I was doing flyers. That's where the promoter side comes in. I was promoting DJ events and concerts. And then eventually in 1996, I moved to uh, Southside Oklahoma City, and I got to live in a house for the first time in my life. I was around... 20 something years old and I lived in the hood of good it's so hood there was drive bys all the time it was right by the airport but the one thing that changed my life I got to it was three hundred fifty dollars a month in 1996 for a three bedroom one bath so it was an economy it was the location mm -hmm. and I remember I had two great roommates and I remember the landlord coming over one time I don't remember why he came over but he came over one time and he's like fixing something. And I was just, of course I was ignorant. I didn't have a dad. So when I saw a man working, I was always intrigued. And I, anytime I saw a blue collar guy, my dad was blue collar. I don't know if that's in my blood. I would always kind of hang out with a blue collar guy. I just talk to them. And I remember him vividly saying, you can own this house. And I was like, what? I could own a house. And that never registered in my mind. I fulfilled the one dream of living in a house, but it's like, you can own this house right here for $35,000. That's what this guy said to me. And that was the defining moment in my world where I, this is possible that I could do this. $35,000 wasn't out of reach. It was impossible in my mind, you know, my living conditions, but it was possible that I could figure it out. So that was the, that was that defining moment in my life. So then three years clicked by 1999, some friends handed me this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You, everyone knows it. Whoopie Woo, $34 million, 34 million copies sold. It was these two 18-year-old kids that were traveling the world that I used to manage. They're banned, and they would had no, no worry. And I, I didn't understand that they can travel the country playing, doing what they love to do, like your, your show is about. It was just so cool, you know, purpose. They did their purpose, but they didn't have fear and they lived in one side of the duplex and they rented the other side and it paid for their expenses. And so at the time I didn't understand, I was just like, what's, first of all, I never heard of a duplex. So I was still learning. And I was like, wow, these parents are rich. And they really weren't rich. They were from Iowa. They were very smart. And so I read the book and, uh, and I just sold everything I owned and started buying assets. That's all I thought about is what is an asset, a vending machine. I would preach like, you know, when I first came to know Christ, I was telling everybody about Jesus. Well, I was a Bible beater. And then like, you're going to go to hell if you don't know Jesus. I'm, I'm being serious, but no one would ever like listen to me. I was like a psycho, like a Jesus freak. And I was like, oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. And so I was like a Jesus freak for freedom, a financial freedom, kind of like you are. You're like, you're so passionate about setting people free about through real estate or even just endeavor of business. I was like that too. And so I, that's all I thought about was assets. And so I tried, I would t preach to people and say, listen, that DV, that VHS DVD player cost you $200. That's a doodad. 
you can spend $200 and buy a vending machine and it can give you money every month. And I was like, and some people would never understood it. Even to this day, even in 2020, no one understands. And so I just started doing that principle from 1999 until today. So exactly 20 years, roughly. I bought my first house in September of 2009 or yeah, 20 years ago. And uh, that deal was phenomenal. And now I, I am set free for life. I mean, it, I mean, I, we can talk about all the success, maybe what motivates me. I don't, I'm not a big fan of telling people that I own a pool. No one knows that. I don't have, I tried deliberately not to have any photos of my pool or my lifestyle because mm-hmm. I just don't think that works driving around a Lamborghini. I just don't, th- I don't have one and I never will because I don't, I'm a utilitarian. I like, I like nice things. I like things that get, do what I need them to do, but I'm not about flash. And I'm, I, I feel when I first got, and if you could talk about this, Augie, you know, I always ask the Lord, I was like, why am I the lucky one? <laughs> like, why do I, this is so easy to me. It's just like, it's, I just, I, you know, I used to argue with God. I used to get mad at God. I was like, okay, why did I get saved at 17? Why didn't I get saved at 16? And that was my first complaint to the Lord. And then the second thing is, it's like, why do I rich, read rich dad, poor dad, and no one else gets it? Like, and so, so I, I even asked my wife this all the time. She's like, well, Stephen, you take action. <laughs> I'm like, I maybe is it a belief system? And the thing is, is like, I had nothing. So I had nothing to lose. What's the worst thing that could happen? I'm in the worst position now. Even today, I'm taking this creative building down. I would have never taken down if I didn't meet Thomas Morgan or if I didn't meet you mm-hmm. or have the fourth right, the for all to do it. But I'm like, what's the worst thing going to happen? Like what's, I lose X amount of money. Okay. It's not like I can't make it again. And Mm -hmm. so I've just been buying assets, um, ever since then. And it's pretty remarkable. Um, what, what does the word success conjure up in your mind? Great question. You know, definition of it. And it's one of those amorphous kinds of subjects. Success to one person can be completely different than success to another person. But yeah, I think that. Even Van well, I was listening to, I don't know if you know, Chris Widener from Dallas. He was mentored under Jim Rohn. And he talks about this just recently. I was listening to a CD and he said that success is usually a financial uh, res- respondent to that. Like the, the first thing success is a million dollars to some people. And I've always thought of that question all the time. And so it's a great question. And <clears throat> I, success, I think for me is freedom. But then, then, then the word freedom is ultimately uh, overrated in society today because people don't know what true freedom, freedom is. So success to me is the ability, you know, to be able to, to do what you want to do, give back um, and meet all my needs. So when I, when I first got successful was when I was first making $1,500 a month and I was debt free. And that was, you know, maybe 10 years ago that it was like the first, first time I was financially debt free and I had enough cash coming in. I, at that time I was single. This is about 15 years ago, 16 years ago that I was single, that I could live off of $1,600 a month and I never had to work again. Now success to someone else could be a fancy car. I, I don't see success that way. I see, I see success um, that I can choose to do what I want to do. For example, if I want, like today, I had to make a choice. I had to, I'm trying to close this deal today, but I made a a real goal of running. So I was actually, you know, I wanted to get to the office by eight o'clock today, but I didn't get to the office until 930 today. I think that's success. I think not success is that I have to do something that I don't want to do. I think success is doing something that you want to do, whatever that may be. And for everyone, that's different. For you, it's different than it is for me. Is it a dollar number? No, I just think that the actual dollar number is more money coming in than I need to live on. And so even in my meeting this morning with my staff, we, we had a Christmas dinner yesterday. And I told, I told my staff, because some people didn't show up. And I was like, why didn't some people show up? Some people don't want to hang out with their work people. And I mm-hmm. thought that's very sad. You know, I go, I don't care what people think, but it's a free meal. And I get it, it's a Sunday, but some people deliberately, some staff members did not come because they don't want to be hanging out with staff members. 
And I thought to myself, and I was like, you know, I was like a little disappointed. And she's, you know, they're just stabbing my, my staff is trying to tell me, you know, some people are just not like that or just not like you. And I was like, I get it. I said, though, I go, the reality is this is the first time in my life that I have access. I said, I really thought about it. I was like, this $500 Christmas dinner, that's pure bottom. Well, of course, I wrote it off on my taxes, but only so 50%. So $250 was really $250 that came out of my my mm-hmm. child's mouth. But I go, that's what freedom is, is that I was willing to bless these key people to have dinner with them. I think that's success. I think that you have ac- uh, you have excess, uh, you have, you have um, excessive, uh, more, uh, more money than you mm-hmm. need. I think that's freedom. Some people think that they need more. I, when I look at deals today, the biggest quite like this building I'm taking down right now, do I really need another headache? Do I really need another business? What, what, what am I trying to do? Is this going to keep me from getting home any earlier? Or does this make me look savvy landlord even cooler? Because I can say now I have $10 million in assets, which $10 million in assets really doesn't mean a darn thing if, if you don't have cash flow. And I think a lot of people get confused with $10 million in assets. Oh, Van Kalenberg is rich. <laughs> okay, buddy. Yeah, and I do grow seventy thousand dollars a month. Okay, buddy. <laughs> okay, it well, sounds sexy, man. Seventy thousand dollars a month is great, unless of course your expenses a month are eighty thousand. Then you kind of have a problem. Yeah, so exactly. It's, it's just, and I think that the Lord, he he can only handle. It blows my mind that I that that much money flows through my hands. Like when I see my tax return, and it's not I'm profiting that. I mean, just people steal from me all the time. I mean, I see I see laborers writing wrong uh, tickets. I see, I, you know, I can argue with people. I see families that I'm taking care of. And at the end of the day, what do I net? Okay. Oh, I, I $10,000. Okay. My mortgages are about 35,000, maybe more. My tax burden this year for my property taxes is over $80,000, mm-hmm. $80,000. That's eight. That's like $9,000 a month people. <laughs> so so when you start chipping away 70 G's, but that doesn't prevent me from not having a lawsuit. That doesn't prevent me from, but I realize that God has put me in a position that I can handle it. You know, I teach my children, I'm not going to give you a hundred dollars if you can't handle $10. And if mm-hmm. you can't handle a hundred dollars, you can't handle a thousand. And so God has allowed me to, with my, with my ability. And I laugh and I think, wow, why am I the lucky one? What makes me so special? I'm not special. I just think that I take it very serious. This is not a hobby. This is a real deal. I'm, I'm a, representing what God has allowed me to have. I'm being a steward of my stuff. And that's so, something that has always impressed me about you from the time we met. And you are infinitely more successful today <laughs> than, than when we first met. You were on your, on your path, and you're still on your path. Mm. But that's one of the things that, that struck me is the fact that you're a good steward not just over money or over assets or relationships, but you're a good steward over life. You know, one of the things that has impressed me, you know, is is the fact that you've taken time to publish a number of books. Now, I know those books don't make you tons of money. I mean, my (laughs) books don't make me tons of money. And, but the good thing is whatever checks come in, go right back out to charity. So, you know, and Kind of the way you describe things, uh, your, your definition of success or what it conjures up in your mind, you know, I've kind of boiled it down and maybe the words are a little different, but I think that the sentiment is the same. You know, success is really having the freedom to live your purpose or your mission, whatever it is that you're called to do. And you help a lot of people. You run events, you do a lot of different things, you do a lot of things in your community. And, you know, you, you speak about your faith quite a bit, and I think that's a good thing. And how has that faith helped lead you either on your path towards success or, better yet maybe, how has it supported you when things weren't going well, when you've had challenges to meet? Well, I mean, I, I came from a desperate position of, of poverty, of not having anything, and so when I came to know Christ, that was everything. So I don't, you know, I go up, I go up and down in depression like anyone else, I would think. You know, the thing I think when you're a high achiever, like successful businessmen, is like you reach your goal 
and then you're depressed again. And I think mm-hmm. that I think having a faith keeps it even kill where I am. I'm humbled every time I do my quiet time. Every time I turn on the Bible app, I'm humbled. Now, yeah, is there days that go by and forget about the Bible app? Absolutely. And I can tell that when my life gets um, out of whack is because I'm not faithful in my time with him. You know, God, it's just simple. Like faith and religion is, is a simple thing. It's just having a relationship. It's just like you and I. It's like, I love you. I wish I was in Florida. Like I was talking to Thomas this morning and he's like, you know, you know for Christmas, they're going to be in Tampa. I'm like, oh, I forgot that you're from Orlando. You know, the thing is, it's like, it's a relationship. We have to foster that to develop. I don't spend time with the Lord so he can bless me. <laughs> like, and I think it's harder being a, a Christian in what is Christianity today. Anyway, people have so many different perceptions of it because it's hypocritical. I, I, I think the faith has just grounded me that I, nothing would have ever happened if it wasn't for him. And I know for a fact that when I was homeless in college and I had no money and money would be, be in my mailbox. Like just like I would be walking, I weighed 190 pounds. I'd be walking on campus and I would have not eaten and people thought I was doing drugs and I just didn't have any money. My mom, you know, lived in California and I was, I didn't know anyone and I had, I didn't have a job and I never missed a meal and someone would be walking. Okay. Hey, why don't you come over to my house and have dinner? And I knew that was the Lord. See, see, God just takes, it's just faith. I think that's the most important thing. I think, why are we doing this in general? Like I, I tried, this is the most I've ever talked about faith publicly because I'm trying to live it out. I don't want to talk about it mm-hmm. because there's just a bunch of charlatans. Now I believe that God has given me this platform. Every time I want to, you know, close down savvy, this is not making money. You talked about books. <laughs> like I would have never written five books. It's just a waste of time. No one reads. And you know, when you, I would disagree. I, you, get, I, you know, one. There's I don't know. I a few day and a lot of them read books. I, I don't know if they're re- I don't know. But you like know, I, I'm seven billion people on the planet. Somebody reads books. I promise. Yeah. I, okay. All right. All right. All right. I'll give it to you. You have a little bit more wisdom than me. Bestseller does not mean it didn't serve a purpose. But you know, to, to, to my faith, I think the quick answer would be it's just to ground me to, for purpose in life. Um, I would never. I just know for a fact that God has done miracles in my world. I just this is simple to me. There's a lot of detail people that have to have you know proof that the Bible's real or, dude. <laughs> Jesus is real. There's no other way around it. So in my world, it's just simple faith for me. I, has it affect me? Yeah, I, would, I, don't, I think all glory goes to him. <laughs> Am I human? Yes. Do I curse? Yes. Do I have to um, apologize? Quite often. Do I have to repent more times than I would like to admit on a daily, hourly basis? Does it make me any better Christian than anyone else? No. But if you want to know Christ, I would love to tell you. But I'm not going to force it, force it on them. I'm going to live it out. Mm-hmm. Well, you know? I mean, my, so that's that's. I don't know if that's your answer. Anything. Yeah, I don't. You know, I don't know if that's your answer. I don't know. We turned this into the Christian show. <laughs> like, well, that's okay. It's it's one of my favorite subjects anyway. Faith. All right. And well, hopefully, is, yeah. I mean, part, I, it is part of part of our our, our core values. So okay. that that's fine because I mean, I live by two rules: love God, love people. That's it. Mm. Do All that. right. You fulfill a lot of a lot of requirements, and um, but anyway, well, shifting back kind of into the into the business world, what kind of mistakes have you made along the way, and and what have you learned from them? Well, you know, first of all, you everyone should read "Failing Forward" by John C. Maxwell because mm-hmm. you're going to fail. I think. Uh, I love it. Tony Robbins. He's like, the more you fail, the more you succeed. I think that you have to fail. You have to take risks. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of things I think I did fast was um, I didn't put the right people on the bus in the right positions. I didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I was writing a podcast the other day about, you know, <clears throat> just not hiring. Do whatever you don't like to do. And I'll, I'll quote this person later. Actually, it's Derek Shivers, and it's a book called All, All, All What You Want to Do. It's a great entrepreneur book, and I can reference it later. But if you, there's someone, something that you hate to do, someone out there loves to do it. So outsource it. Mm-hmm. Something that you hate to do, but we tend to be cheap, and so we cut our grass. 
and we're you know we're we're robbing a blessing from someone else. I think that's one of the, my big mistakes. Um, I should have done that. Um, <clears throat> what else? I, what should have been created did create a finance way earlier. I did it when I first started in 1999. All my first 10 or 11 deals were creative. Then I got uh, I got fat with or lazy with banks. They made it super simple. And then now I'm like 20 years later, I'm like, why did I not be Augie by light <laughs> and not do this all creatively? I mean, just before we got on the phone here, I, 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 I was working on a creative deal, like with a realtor, like, Hey, how can we get more subject to use done? And how do we incentivize the listing realtor? And then I was walking them through the process. I'm trying to think of what are the mistakes. Um, I think, you know, this is related to business, but I think health is one of the, the biggest mistake that I've ever made, being ignorant about food and uh, that process, using cheap foods, uh, you know, what, saying low self-esteem is a big a mistake, uh, limiting beliefs is another mistake, and not investing into personal development uh, a lot more heavier. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm down, you know, I would read about Zig Ziglar and he would, you know, read several hours a day, you know, Warren Buffett leads, read seven, eight hours a day, Brian Tracy reads two to four hours a day. And I'm like, so I'm mean, like, how do you do that? How do you make money? You know, how do you get deals done? If you're reading all the time, I'm thinking they're like cozied up in their you know house. And I realized, um, at 46, I mean, man, I need to spend a lot more time on personal development. I need to spend at least a minimum of an hour reading some book and growing personally. I wish I would have had this vigor ferociously, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, I just read Rich Dad Poor Dad and I just put it to action. And I think that's success is putting it to action. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what it would have been like if I would have really spent a lot more time learning and reading, buying, not just buying classes like your course and, and never opening it in really actually going through the course. That's a mistake. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you, that you bring that point up, but, you know, people don't think about the impact of one hour. You say, yeah, it's an hour. You know, it's like landlords. Oh, it's only $200 a month cash flow. Why do I need this house? But one hour a day over 20 years, how many hours is that? Well, it's it, compounded. You know, I mean, I know now. 7,000 hours. They say it takes 10,000 hours to become a master of anything. Well. At an hour a day, you're almost there. Well, I know for sure that um, the more you know, the more you make. Mm-hmm. It's simple. The reason why it's so funny, I, um, you would love this because this is hysterical. And when people hear this, they're going to, I'm telling you people, I am considered an expert in my market on subject twos. No one wants to do them. I'm like, <laughs> like seriously, it, it, I just... <laughs> I laugh because I am not an expert. I, I literally have just done a few of them, maybe six or seven of them. And I have had good mentors. But that's the... That's for those, the for those folks that don't know what a subject to transaction is, it's a transaction where you buy a property and take over the payments on an existing mortgage. It's There's not a whole easy. system and process that goes behind it. But that's what Steve was referencing. In case you're not familiar with that term. Yeah, and it's it's not an easy process. It's just like, you know... Um, I would, I just was working with another investor just a little while ago and it blew my mind how you develop, how do you put a Dunkin' Donuts in, you know, how, 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 how does a strip center go down? You, you get a house, you get the land under contract and then you have six months. I was like, you got six months to find, to lease it up. Yep. I was like, wow, that's an advantage. So you tied up a million dollar property with $5,000 and you have six months. And then you got to put in 20%. So it's a $2 million deal. So you got to come up with 400,000 that you can borrow privately, right? Yep. You could buy it, borrow 400,000 privately. So let me get this straight. You can develop a Dunkin' Donuts strip center with another dental space that brings in like $200,000 a year in revenue. And it blew my mind. I mean, that's education. I mean, I think that we need to spend or teach children or investors. And that's why I love what you're doing with Creative Wealth USA down there. And you're just, you have this authentic class of teaching people at all levels 
about how to invest. No one's willing to do that. And it all boils down to knowing. My, my friend of mine that was walking me through this deal, he was lucky enough that some other developer that has developed Chick-fil-A's all over the country and these huge properties all over, like, I mean, just huge properties. And they, they turn key them. They, they find the land, they build it, then they sell it to the franchise. And then mm-hmm. they walk away and they profit from it. I mean, to me, it sounds like a lot of work. Like, I want to do it, you know, I'd be in. But that was my friend's dream, and he's actually working on his dream to be a developer. Now, I don't want to do that, but I thought the numbers were fascinating. Looking at the, the financial documents, looking at the performance, I'm like, hey, what's this fee? How's this going to happen? Where is this going to go? How long will this close? What will happen if you can't lease it out? You know, is, is, you have to have a Dunkin' Donuts. Can you use anyone? Can, why can't you make it six units? Why not four units? You know, it's just fascinating. It's just another, it's just another dynamic of real estate. But it's a, they got the, this team is an expert of it. And mm-hmm. how are they becoming an expert of it? Be, because of education and learning. And I think that's, to answer your question, is the mistake is that we're not taking it serious enough of our education, that we just buy classes uh, and want to be millionaires, but we don't want to put the work in. Mm-hmm. We don't want to hire coaches. And you, you have to do that stuff. You got to put the work in. You got to buy the courses. You got to hire the mentors. And you gotta, then you got to put it into action. And I think that's the biggest mistake that I've done that I'm just now finally getting to do that properly in that order. Well, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, one, one of my students, he's been with us, I guess, four or five years. Um, and he's gone from single family, kind of like yourself, to apartment buildings. And they just took down <clears throat> a 129-unit complex. Wow. Now, that's pretty significant it was under 10 million but still it needed a significant capital raise and because of learning how to use private money how to have private money conversations Mm -hmm. they were able to raise two million in cash and bank finance the balance and it'll probably take five to seven years before there's a, a cash out or a refinance type event and you know, based on the numbers, unless there's some catastrophic event in the economy, which is unlikely because of where this is located, it's the right kind of a property. The likelihood is everybody will end up doubling them, their investment. And that's a passive investment. And the same thing with, you know, shopping center development. Not everyone works, mm-hmm. but when you learn how to do the right due diligence and how to structure the deals and take the effective actions, that's where the rewards come from. It's awesome. You know, much like you started out the same exact way. And, but when you start to learn, it whets your appetite. And those that continue to learn, continue to grow. Now, you know, it's interesting that you said that I think would be a really good course um, is private money conversations. I think, that's what we need to do. People don't take the time to learn. Like Mm -hmm. I was talking to a student earlier, you know, they got all this knowledge. They know everything about subject two, but they don't know how to talk to somebody about a subject two. Like, right. You may know the inner workings or you may know the the structure of uh, how it works and the documents. Great. But if you can't sell it to them by Mm -hmm. pitfalls, then it was all mute. It was a waste of education. I think there needs to be a balance. You know, I love the cone of learning. You ever see, you know, it's actually participating, stimulation, actually doing it, role playing. I think those are the most important things. That mm-hmm. I think that we need to, and I know that's been your heart and mission, is like we need to take back the school system and really just have hands-on training. This is like an apprenticeship. Like mean, this is, you know, you can't go to tattoo school. You got to sit next to a tattoo artist. And do right. it. They do that with the medical field. Why they don't do mm-hmm. that with, with investors? They just give you a couple of classes and then go out and manage someone else's money, without having any risk involved in their own time. You know, yeah, it's own. unfortunate that our educational system does not teach our kids that life is not a dress rehearsal. <laughs> yes, uh, um, Jim Rohn or somebody. No, I don't know who said that, but I just heard that just recently. This, this no, there's no. Um, 
the not warm up. This is not a warm up game. Right. You're there is no you're, you're scrimmage. In the there is no there is no scrimmage here. This is it. This is but the real you're, deal. You're you're playing in the major leagues every day of your life. Uh, do you have a role model? Uh, I have um, like physically, like I have several role models. I mean, my ultimate role model is Jim Rohn, and he's mm-hmm. obviously passed away. He uh, is my um, ultimate role model. Um, I can just hear his voice, and I read it. Um, you know, the obvious one, obviously is Jesus. Uh, but you know, like in the flesh, you know, I, I admire certain people's commitment to runners. Like there's this book, you know, like, like David Coggins is a book called, um, you can't hurt me. I think that's a good role model Mm -hmm. of physique. A rich role is an ultra marathon. It's a, it's a phenomenal book. You need to listen to Augie. It's called finding excuse me, Finding Ultra by Rich Roll. It's a phenomenal mm-hmm. book. Um, that would be a role model to me, just the, the his ability of, of overcoming addiction and sobriety to uh, being 40-something years old and taking his life back in, in the health aspect. I think that's a good role. <clears throat> My wife is a role model for me. The way she serves our family and our and our children, I just I get inspired on her patience and um, you know each three of them, my children, two of them you can kind of bark at them, (laughs) but my third one you can't. I mean, you you got to get on your knee and talk to her in a different tone. You can't say, "Katie, come over here," that would Mm -hmm. crush her. And you know, my wife has dialed in on that her personality type. Um, I have friends and uh, mentors that are uh, inspire me, but um, you know, I, I would say Andrew Carnegie would be my ultimate role model. If I had and to, why think is of, that? <clears throat> um, I, I just love his story. I, you know, I didn't like his upbringing. His, if you study back then um, in the tycoon age, that you know, his thing is that he made all of his wealth. Uh, worked really hard and very lonely uh, for the first half of his life. And then the second part of his life, he gave it all away. Uh, You know, I follow that mantra. Um, You know, another role model is the pastor of our church, Greg Crochelle, just that they give it all away. They give out the Bible app. They're they're the ones that created the Bible app. Mm -hmm. I want, I want to be able to give away. I have, I love your goal of, I mean, your goal of one billion dollars, like you told me that like ten years ago, it seems like like six years ago. I'm like, this dude's psycho. I'm like, he's an old dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, you did for you know, uh, you know, all my friends, you know, Thomas raised about you. And blah blah blah. I'm like, yeah, I gotta meet this guy. And I'm like, I met him. He's okay. He's a good teacher. Yeah, he's a good guy. And they're like, I'm gonna give away one billion dollars. Of course, my mind was so small and did not articulate that. Mm-hmm. Like one billion dollars. And then, you know, as God has broken me and God gave me a challenge to give away $100,000 last year, and I was like, okay, and I gave away 100000 And then this year was like 30000 and I didn't, I, I mean, I still got 30 days, but I need a 30G somewhere. And, uh, and then God wants me to give away a million dollars. And so, you know, I, I've talked to some people about this and is that giving away $100,000 for 10 years? Is that creating a business that throws off a million dollars? I mean, but I love the way you do yours. It's like, I want to get as many investors and you had it all down to a mathematical equation, which I love Mm -hmm. math. And it just made sense. It just healed my soul that, man, if you go down in history, Augie, and I'm one of them, you know, we're doing this marathon to support you. I mean, how gnarly is that? that, That's fabulous. I mean, a, a wheelchair initiative. So talk, talk I mean, about that a little bit, because I, I know you and I have a, a call scheduled, you know, to actually start working on some of the finer points and the details. Yeah, I mean, but, I can tell you about it. Well, yeah, just yeah, for I anybody mean, who's, who's listening, yeah. it's going to be a virtual marathon. Yeah, so, well, yeah. Right? So let me, yeah, 5K. Half, yeah. Half, or, what is it? So, 10K, 20K, 30K? No, it's a 5K and a half, but let me, let me tell you how it happened. So we're having okay. dinner, and I said this on my podcast just recently, but I need to tell you the version. So I was, you, you sat next, we sat next to each other at dinner and you were showing me pictures of, 
um, your trip. And I was like, yeah, this is awesome. I was like, and the Lord spoke to me right then. And he's like, you need to help this guy. And I was like, I can't, I'm like, okay. I need to help him. I'm like, how? Make a flyer for him and put him in all your books. I was like, okay, I could do that. Nobody buys books. So I could, I could, handle, I could handle that deal. No, he's like, you need to make a design a flyer for him and spread the message and put it all in your stuff. Okay. So like all the stuff that I sell, all my classes, all the, we're, you know, we're doing investor weekend nationwide. Okay. I get, it. so, you know, chair of the love is going to be, you know, our sponsor. Okay. Got it. I, all right, Jesus. So then I just like disappear. And then somebody, you know, I'm like, I'm really trying to define to help you. I'm like, you know, and you were out of town and I, it was right after Ohio. I was like, I was going to call you. And then I was like, okay, I, I need to do this. I need to get this done. And I'm like, and then some, some random dude at the real estate club meeting comes up to me and says this. Now, I didn't realize this, but a lot of people follow me, which I'm honored that people follow me because like, I hope I'm not leading people in the wrong, like I'm not, I'm human. So I'm going to fail you people. So get ready. But so a lot of people follow me on this running, which I'm not a runner. I became one. But this dude walked up to me, and this is a guy that I've known for a long time. He's actually read all my books. So I, I follow him. He follows me. And he's like, Stephen, man, I've been following you for a long time. I'm like, yeah, thanks, buddy. And he's like, um, you know, your real estate's great. I'm like, okay, great. Well, like, I, I don't need you to judge me, but thank you. And he's like, but the great thing that I have noticed about you is you're running, and it's really inspired me. And I was like, oh, okay. So, of course, that's why I keep posting about running. Like a lot of people don't know I run a lot and no one knows because I'm like, this is like, why am I telling the world about my running? Because it just makes me look conceited. Well, then, then the Lord spoke to me. He's like, you need to do this marathon. And then I, I was I'm reading this book that about creating community. This is you. So I'm reading this book about business and, you know, I read a book a week and I was like, man, I need to create a community and how could I create this community? And so I need to do a marathon and I was like, okay. So then I Googled up marathons and I found virtual marathons and I was like, I'm going to do a virtual marathon. Of course, I have no idea. I've dig deep into this project. Augie is burying me. I'm like, this is another thing I need to do. So then I was like, oh, savvymarathon.com is available. Great. I had no idea what I'm doing. And so we just, this is how it's going to go down. We're going to charge a hundred bucks, I think. That and gets you get the bib, you get a medal, you get a t-shirt, and then whatever. So hopefully about it's about fifty dollars a person to run a marathon. And the other fifty dollars a person that we're gonna give to buy wheelchairs. So every three people, we're gonna buy a wheelchair, hopefully. Wow. And so the cool thing about it, and I is that we're gonna do it on May 3rd. 2020 in it now locally we're just going to just show up at the at the lake because the lake is about 11 nine miles around the lake 11 miles around the lake so but you can you could start this i haven't figured it out but i'm still researching but we're going to start the marathon sometime in february and end or some two months or three months before and then we're going to do a big push and then you know we're going to donate money and and get healthy and I realized that a half a marathon is pretty intense for people. So my wife was like, we probably need to do a 5K because my kids can't run a marathon. So mm -hmm. my kids are going to raise money for this thing for you. And we're going to have a raising fund. And I haven't gotten to the details. But that's basically it. So on May 3rd, every year, we're going to do a marathon from here on in. It's going to be a half marathon and a 5K. We're going to meet at 7 o'clock at the lake for sure. I'm going to be there with a banner on. It says, meet here. We're going to throw up some water stations and we're just going to have fun and I'm figuring out the registration and have it automatically go to you and uh, that's it. And so you're the birth of the savvy and so the savvy marathon and then next year we're going to probably do another cause, which is probably whiz kids, which is I'm mm -hmm. all about uh, literacy because uh, I got out of liter, you know, I was six years behind in reading. So I, I have became wealthy because of reading. So I want to contribute this. So every year we're going to pick a charity or a cause or something that, that can benefit people running. And I hope that it would catch on. Uh, five people may show up mm -hmm. or hundred people. I don't know. It's very nerve wracking. Just the medals alone are about five to 10 bucks, 10 bucks. But um, it's exciting. 
Um, I know you're, well, you have an there, anniversary. There's a, there's a good chance we get the word out early enough. We can get people all over the country participating. Yeah, I mean, if so many people they, they follow can me. Pick their get, own spots. They can lead in their own city. Yeah, and so many, I mean, and I, 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 I don't know how to track it. I mean, we're just, we're just going to wing this deal like, hey, go to this website. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you want, the, you want us to handle it, you meant, send us the 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. you want to handle it on your own you do the 50 there and 50 I, I think i don't know we're just trying to figure it out we don't know the total cost like the shirt's 10 bucks and the metal's mm -hmm. 10 bucks and then there's some fees in there and mailings but this is diy you know integrity run the race earn a medal yeah um we may we may just ship it all at once we may just you have to prove that you ran it like with a mm -hmm. facebook photo um but I'm excited. Maybe we'll run it. Well, maybe this will be a charity thing that we run every year. Maybe we'll run it in next year. We'll run it in Florida and uh, it may take off. I don't know. Well, we may get some people here in Florida to, to push it. So it's running simultaneously. Yeah. I mean, days. you know, it's again, it's just always, no, I wouldn't say cliche. It's just the easy, it's the Lord's thing. It, it is his deal. I mean, the more I yeah. dig into it, it's a lot of work to organize it. Like just figuring out these metals is already mm -hmm. a big ordeal in my mind. But uh, I'm gonna. We're gonna do it. It's going down. I hope that we raise. You know, I need to set a goal of. I don't know. 30, 30 wheelchairs would be there. One hundred fifty bucks a piece. Is that right? Yep. So we would need a hundred people. So we would. Our goal. And how much is no? What's a container? How, how many container is container load is forty two thousand, and that's two hundred and eighty wheelchairs. Okay, I can't do that. <laughs> well, wait a minute. You maybe you can't do it by yourself, but I think if I reach out to the runners that I know, you never know. We may okay, well we'll shoot for the moon. Logistical support. All right, so I know from Oklahoma City, I'm gonna try to get a hundred people, and that would be thirty something wheelchairs minimum. Right. So if we could get ten cities to do that, there's yeah. a container load. Now, yeah. So then I would have to hire a full-time person, but I'm down. I, I got a guy working here, Jeremy. <laughs> He's got nothing going on over here. Well, I, I'll talk to my people that... Uh, yeah, it's that, awesome. Well, we got the logo and, done. And see what kind of uh, additional support they might be able to drum up to help. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so anyway, that's... Know, it doesn't mean you have to do this whole thing, you know, by yourself with, you know, scotch tape and... Well, as soon as we... Plan. Yeah, as soon as we... We just fired up like a temporary website, but probably in another... Probably January, February... We will uh, probably January. We're uh, we're gonna ask for volunteers. So mm -hmm. that's going to happen. Someone's going to step up. If that's you out there, you feel like you're compelled to get involved, or you have. Yeah, some if anybody's experience. watching that wants to get involved. Yeah, absolutely. L let us know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just you can find us anywhere. Forward their number onto me. I'll call them. If yeah, you're in Oklahoma you know, City, even better. Augie, A U G I E at creatingwealthusa.com. That's awesome. And let us know that you know you want to kind of be the ambassador in your city. You've got a bunch of runners who know a bunch of runners. And before you know it, this thing could really uh yeah. really explode. I mean, it's for I mean the impact that it makes. I love what you said to me the other day. You were like, Man, one wheelchair affects eight people. I mean, yeah. Elaborate on that. Well, that's, I, I was surprised, you know, I always thought the recipient got all the benefit, but yes. it turns out that family members, siblings, caretakers, neighbors, the whole community benefits because when a disabled person without, it, without mobility has no chair, they have to be carried everywhere. And, you know, we were in Guatemala and I met a guy whose brother carried him literally on his back. And because he was a double amputee, they went back to back with their arms interlocked. And the older brother carried the younger brother. The younger brother was 65 years old. I met a mother in Nicaragua this past August who carries her 17-year-old son, who's almost a grown man. He's got a neurological disorder, so he cannot walk. His mom, who's probably, I don't know, 45, maybe 50. She's carrying this kid who's the size of a man because he outgrew his wheelchair when he was nine years old. And there's just no way for these people to replace a chair or even to obtain one if they don't have one and need it. So for many of the people we work with, it's their first wheelchair. And so, you know, if the disabled family member has no way to be mobile, that means all the care that they require, everything that's needed 
comes from the family and the neighbors. And that means the other kids in the family get less time. Now, you know, with, with three kids in, in your household, how much time each one requires, but imagine, heaven forbid, one was disabled and had to be carried everywhere. They need that much more, you know, hands-on attention, and that simply requires less time because it's only 24 hours in a day. So eight people kind of benefit, and, um, you know, I'm working on my 2020 goals, but I'm working on them for the decade. Mm. I'm declaring this upcoming decade that starts in 2020 as the, as the decade of vision. Wow. And we all need to have a vision for our lives. And by the end of the decade, I want to deliver 40 container loads wow. of wheelchairs. That's awesome. And, What's that number? Oh, it's a lot. It's 8,000 almost, let's see, 40 times 300 of you, like, 24,000 shares, something like that. Wow. I mean, it's, it's a massive number. But, you know, the idea is I don't do this by myself. I invite people to help. You know, it's funny. We were on a cruise in, in France about four or five months ago. Met a couple from Colorado. And Thanksgiving Day, I opened up my email, and they donated a wheelchair. And, and just to see that, you know, I get this automated wheelchair, you know, donation notice, you know, it just made Thanksgiving all, all that much more special. And so, you know, we live and we serve. I mean, that, that, that's the key. And so it's powerful. And if we can deliver, you know, 8,000, I think the number was like 8,000 wheelchairs. If we can deliver 8,000 wheelchairs, we can affect 80,000 people. It's awesome. So that would make it a pretty good decade. And that should also get us halfway or further towards our billion dollar challenge too. You know, I want to help people learn how to become financially independent, successful, whatever you want to define it, so that you can donate $100 a week to the charity of your choice, not mine, but yours, mm. and make a difference in your family, in your community. Because once you start to realize that giving doesn't take away from anything you have, Mm -hmm. you start to learn that you're in a completely different space. You go from scarcity to abundance. Yes. You know, and that's a big, a big part of what this podcast is about. You know, it, it's really about the fact that every single one of us can make a difference. Now you were virtually homeless and you gave away a hundred thousand dollars for no charitable purposes. You know, I never expected in my lifetime to be doing pretty much everything I'm doing today oh, yeah. and, and, and to ever get to a point in life where every day is such a huge blessing yeah, and then as I bless you. others, I am blessed so much more than the blessing I try to give. Well, let's just, well, let's dial back one step there. You said something that's very powerful. I think people need to know that scarcity breeds fear and you're never going to be wherever you need to be if you're full of fear. So I would squash that as soon as possible. There is an abundance, and I know it, that's becoming a cliche word or an overused word, but there really is an abundance. There is opportunity everywhere. We're just not trained to see it because we're driven by fear. Take the fear element out, and you will, your eyes will be lifted off, and you can do anything. Anything is possible. And I know it, that's another word that's easy, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, I wouldn't be here to, when, when I set that goal, and it's a long, detailed story on the $100,000, I thought it was impossible. It was impossible in my mind. I, I never told anybody that I was, I mentioned it a couple of times, but God was faithful. It came through. It, it, he just, just the power, I guess the point is, is the power of believing that you can do it. I can't do it. I'd said, okay, God, if this is your goal, then you need to make it happen. And he made it happen. And on November 30th, 31st, I, well, I get, wrote the final $10,000 check. And then I got really upset with the government because you can't, you can't donate more than 60% of what you make. So I thought that was really interesting. I, got, I had to pay tax. Well, you can. Then it goes beyond a tithe and it's an offering. Well, I, I tithe on top of that. But I know, point, I get it. But the point was, 
I mean, it's very frustrating because I was set up like a, I'm set up like an escort. But the thing is, you have to be like a corporation. You can give out more. Yeah. So just FYI, but you know, paying tax on money that on money that I've donated. But um, it was a lesson well learned. Obviously, I'm still alive. Obviously, I'm still rolling and trucking, and opportunities are everywhere. Just like the opportunities that I have going on right now. And I think that you, as listeners. You really, I know you may be broke or depressed or frustrated, fat, skinny, missing a meal. There's abundance. There's someone I learned in Ohio, and I know you learned this, Augie, but there's this thing called human value or human capital. And you can be successful for someone else. You could volunteer for Augie. I know when Vincent started working for you, and he's a wonderful man. Just the opportunities that Vincent sees that you want him to be wealthy. You want him to buy houses. You want him to succeed. What an opportunity that he came to serve. And now he's, he bought his first house just recently, a couple of years ago, right? Mm-hmm. He, he would have never done all that stuff. And not to put it, he said possible. He's, you know, but he brought human value. And so when you start thinking, what value can you bring? I love watching the Ohio group and she's like, can anyone do systems? And someone stood up and I do systems. Someone can do this. And some, you know, remember whatever you hate to do, someone loves to do. Mm-hmm. So let someone love to do something that you hate to do and you can create value. I'm a hustler. Okay. <laughs> or in your case, you're creative. Hey, Augie, how can we make this deal happen? And so if I have to give you an equity position in the deal, that's fine. I would have never, and I have done many subject twos with attorneys Mm -hmm. because I knew they were going to get complicated. I knew they would have backlashes. I knew we were stepping in uncharted grounds. I knew there would be fees. I knew there'd be costs, but I was willing to lose some equity so I could have a reassurance. Someone was going to hold my hand with me. We were going to fight the battle together. Not everything has to be on your own. Not everything has to be all yours. That's, that's where you destroy the abundance, you know, the abundance mentality. You know, there's enough to go around. That deal that I'm talking about, that was a $700,000 subject to I took down. I mean, it's phenomenal. And I'm so glad that I did a partner on it because there were some things that were way over my head. And when they accelerated the clause, because of this, because they said we defaulted, but we didn't default, and you know, and we're back and forth uh, fighting over two hundred thousand dollars worth of equity. I would have given up, but I didn't. I came out with a paycheck. So mm-hmm. that's because of the abundance mentality. You can't you can't do it all on your own in this place. It's impossible. You got to have mentors. You got to go to class. You got to show up, and it's not easy. But you got to do it. And I, I'm telling you, I'm going to go to my grave wondering. Why isn't anyone else? Why isn't there more Augies? Why isn't there more Savvies? Where are they? And what, what's, why are they hiding out? Not, I mean, I, I ask the same questions that you are thinking, listeners. Ask the questions. Mm-hmm. Seek the mentors. All right. I know we're, we're beating this up. What other questions we have? Come on, man. Well, we're in an no, hour. Actually, well, two things that I want, just wanted to cover. One is tell us about Savvy Landlord what that is and how people can find it and be blessed by it because being a landlord is not nearly as good as being a savvy landlord. Okay. So here's the deal. Well, we have this organization called savvyinvestors.com and we're in the middle of a transition of the website. So if you go there right now, don't be disappointed. It's all screwed up. We're fixing it. But anyway, Savvy Investors, we have a podcast called SavvyPodcast.com. And I am the Savvy Landlord, but I'm going to die someday. So we are dropping the landlord off of our business, off of our company. So the Savvy Landlord technically is a book that I written back in 2012. That's exactly how I bought 50 units from nothing until I bought those 50 units. And I... The publisher was like, you sure you want to put addresses in here? Yes. And the reason why I wrote the book is because I think Rich Dad Poor Dad is a phenomenal book, but it didn't go through step by step. And so I went through every deal, exactly how I did it, where I found it, how did I finance it creatively or through a bank. 
with the addresses. You can look it up on the county assessor. You could see I owned it. You could see I can still own some of them, most of them. And so that's why I wrote Rich Dad Poor. I mean, uh, The Savvy Landlord. I wrote the book because it was a dream. I sold the business at that time. I had some money and I hired a writer. So Walter and I, we met twice a week for nine months and we wrote The Savvy Landlord in 2012. I never knew that it would birth into where it is today. Now we're like a mini conglomerate of education. We do seminars, uh, one called Investor Weekend, that hopefully one day will be coming to a city somewhere. And uh, we do classes locally. We do the landlord lunch. And we just, we just want to educate people and find the like-minded people and find freedom. I am the savvy landlord, so we're dropping the savvy landlord. Now it's just the savvy investors. That cop. Excellent. Well, I think it, it. You've certainly earned the right to go beyond the the landlord mantra. Yes. So I, I wish I never knew. You know, people ask me when I used to speak when I first started speaking, where did you come up with the name? I was like, that was the only domain name I can come up with. Well, yeah. that's okay. Sometimes it's you know different things. You know, but creating wealth USA is just you know Robert G. Allen. Robert, you know that was a life change book creating wealth. I mean, that's one of the books I've always referenced all the time. I mean, I just duplicated Robert G. Allen's, you know, if you haven't read that book, it's called creating wealth by Robert G. Allen. Mm -hmm. Basically you can be a millionaire in 10 years. And I know that you're a mathematical guy, so you'll get this. So you buy a house and you you hold (laughs) on to it and you do it. I just did that exact formula on steroids. I just ramped it up. And that's how we've done basically the same kind of a thing. Yeah. But, you know, my philosophy is a little broader because I just look at opportunity and I never want to be a bad steward when it comes to opportunity. So I don't want to be only equipped to do one kind of transaction. I want to have lots of ways to put the deal together, mm-hmm. lots of ways to extract profits from it, and lots of ways to help people on both sides of the transaction, regardless of which side I'm on. And it's made a huge difference. You know, it's, it's not having that fear, but it's having love for people for, you know, true concern to make sure that nobody gets taken unfair advantage of and that everything is done in a win-win format. Now, my final question, Uh Oh, is there one question you wanted me to ask that I didn't or just the last thought you wanted to share before we wrap up? Um, well, questions I always ask are, you know, what goals and dreams do you have? Okay. So let that be your, your question. What, what goals and dreams? So it's a loaded question. So, you know, what what I want to do is I, I would, my, if I could, before I die, I would love to create an entity like savvy investors, or maybe I know that I'm called to be an entrepreneur so that's something new that's been mulling over in my world. But I would like to create an entity that would propel the kingdom, the church, um, this church called Life Church. Um, it's life.church. And it's a multiple campus church. That's, there's one in Florida. They're all over the place. I would love to create a business that threw off a million dollars a year to support that church or support ministries or missionaries or just charitable stuff like um we served at thanksgiving my family we went down to the rescue mission and i would love to have a business that would throw off money i would love to be like bill gates not like bill gates as a a billionaire or uh, and there's nothing wrong with that i don't i don't want the fame and fortune i think i'm already (laughs) savvy enough i think i've already i'm already cool i've already been a dj i think that was the ultimate dream of mine at one time and i'm a dj uh, that was cool. Nineteen ninety-two, yeah, to ninety-five. Uh, for about three years, I was cool, and then I've already I've met celebrities in my lifetime. The only regrets I have right now are I would love to go to Europe. I definitely want to go to um, the Ecuador thing with you guys one time before I roll out, mm-hmm. um, and just you know educate my children as much as possible and create a legacy. I, um, and I'm not handing it down to them. I just would like it to propel. That's why we're making decisions to get rid of the landlord name because we're so much more than just a landlord. Yeah, we have houses and we manage them and we know how to do it and we're savvy about it. But we want to propel the future for 
to be people to be self-sufficient with their investments and may it be private lending, uh, which is I'm very passionate about um, to helping other people to be private lenders. And then um, I don't know, that would be my ultimate dream. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm living my dream every day. I get to spend time with my children. You know, I get to go home at three 30 when they get off um, school, I'm there. And it, that's, that's my dream. So I, I live my dream. I never, my, my mom was never there. Uh, I don't really know my dad. And so I want my kids when they're older, not that, that we lived in a nice house or, uh, they're like, my dad was there and you know, I'm living that goal right now. My daughter's 10. I got eight more years with her and you know, I got a little one who's six and I got about 12 more years with her. So I got 12 more years of just, uh, laying low. And then after 12 more years, you know, who knows, yeah. Augie, I could be creating wealth, uh, franchisee in Oklahoma city, there which you would go. be really cool. Cause you know, we, we really want to, we want to diversify our brand as well. And, and we want, you know, the ultimate thing that I, you know, the products that we have rolling out right now are like investor weekend is a product. And we, we would love for you to have that, that franchise down there. And it's, it's an ambassador program, but we want other people to be successful because of us and because of you. It's a mutual consent. So what I'm saying is, is like right now we're looking for people that want to host Investor Weekend and they they own that they own that market and we come and you come and speak or if you're available, mm-hmm. you sell your products and services. Only we, we're trying to allow one speaker. And then if there's any revenue, which there's usually some revenue, that promoter will receive that. It helps us because it helps our brand. It strengthens our brand. And it benefits them. I think that I would, I would love, it's like, I love raising up coaches right now and, um, that they are getting paid. Uh, someone calls me, Hey man, can you coach me? And I'm like, I can't, I don't have the time right now, but I got this great guy and he gets to coach that person Mm -hmm. and, um, where they're at and they get paid and we, we get a little bit to help them with resources and opportunities and, you know, I would love to see that business model uh, go down that everyone benefits. I think that where we go wrong as a society, I create a product and I take all the money and there's nothing wrong with being wealthy, but then there's more ways that we can spend and make the money, you know, um, velocity and, and help other people. So it's like, yeah. I'm benefiting that guy. And that it's like, you know, when you came and spoke for us, a lot of people don't know this. I need to let people know this, that when a speaker goes speak, you know, they're, they're splitting some, they cost them a lot of money to get on a plane and get there. Not only that the hours or years or months to write that course, but then they sell it and then the promoter gets paid from it. And it's, there's a two way street there. One, you're you're giving the speaker an opportunity to, to, to get his name out and to reach a clientele that he may not never ever to reach. And at the same time, the promoter gets to receive something to, to take the risk to put the event on. I want to create more of those opportunities for everyone. Like if someone can coach someone else, there's a benefit. What I've been seeing lately, which is very fascinating, is that a lot of people have been taking percentages of deals from students. I don't know if you've seen that lately, but I, I have a podcast that I just I'm about to release tomorrow where I interviewed that guy that's madly in love with you. And um, he paid money. Okay. Yeah, he paid like a coaching fee and they did a deal together and then they split the deal. I mean, at first you're like, you're giving me, let me get this straight. You, you, I paid Augie $2,000 to coach me for a month. Yes. And then Augie uh, helped me find a deal. And then Augie told me exactly what to do. And then they did the deal, closed the deal, sold the deal, and they profited 20000 And Augie gets 10 and they got 10 and some people I think would be like frustrated, but this kid, you know, cause it's like, well, I did all the work. See, people don't value relationships or knowledge. The, mm-hmm. the kid thing, the kid goes through this whole story and he would have never done the deal. He was very fearful. Several, it was $70,000 that they put in. They put him and some other students put it together. So it was like a group coaching. They put them and they had a success and they made money. And it wasn't like a windfall, but he says it was the best experience in the world. Think about it. Here's the thing, society, you've got to put skin in the game. That's, that's true. Why, that's why a lot of people, you know, you, you buy these courses, 
And yeah, you, you put some skin in the game, but it, you didn't really do the work. You know, the, the guy that wrote the course, some courses, put the work in. Are you going to put the same amount of work in? And so I think it's a mutual thing that a lot of people, they think they just buy the course, don't go it, and they're going to be rich or they're going to spend $40,000 on a, some traveling show and they're mad. Did you make the calls? Did you well, yeah, at the, at the end of the day, I mean, <clears throat> different mentors have different modes of operation. Yeah. You know, I've, with new students, I never split deals. It's their deal. I want them to make 100% of the profits. When people become more educated, they get to a larger deal, something that's more than they can handle, and they want to invite partners or joint venturers, you know, then I, I don't have such an issue because I, I don't want ever there to be even a perception of a conflict of interest. Because as you know, sometimes deals go the other way. And if people don't do things right, they could take a beating. And I never want to you know, feel like I've dragged a student into a deal that was too risky for them. Hmm. And so, you know, we just have, have had a very solid operating approach for the last almost, I don't know, 15, 16 years. And, and it's worked out really well. And, you know, there are different structures, but, you know, one of my mentors very early on said, either way, whether you pay for it or you don't pay for it, you will take a seminar when it comes to your investing. Okay. And that's just, that's the nature of life. Life is, is a constant opportunity to get educated. And success is a lousy teacher. Failure is a great teacher, but nobody wants to fail. So my, my recommendation to people is always don't consider it failure, consider it feedback. And feedback is what empowers us to make adjustments going forward rather than running away. I, and Steven, I, think the, I, the, I have okay, so, one more thing and we're out. Yep. I mm -hmm. think the thing that just to put the cherry on the top of what you said, which is a phenomenal is we have to take responsibility. Yes. The first habit of highly effective people. Take responsibility. We are response hyphen able. We are responsible for our outcomes in life. That's it. And it's just the way it works. But Stephen, I've so enjoyed having you, you know, on the show today. Uh, your insights, as always, are just right on. That's what I and think I, about and you. I love your, <clears throat> your willingness to share in a very vulnerable and open way. So <clears throat> I yeah, thank you. Um, I look forward to our upcoming marathon. That's going to be yes. awesome. May 3rd, and, 2020. Yeah, May 3rd, 2020. It's three We're days before it. my next anniversary, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, hey, uh, but, you know, I, I do want to thank you and, and all of the folks that either watch us or listen to us uh, for being here. You can find us um, on a variety of podcast distribution outlets, but you can also find us on Facebook at Playing Full Out with Augie Bylot. That's our Facebook group. If you're real estate investors or folks who would like to become real estate investors, we've got a great Facebook group called Transaction Engineering Full Time, over 2,000 strong. And my mission for you is to have you completely successful so that you can live your mission, your purpose, that which is going to give you tremendous fulfillment every day. Instead of waking up in the morning going, oh, God, it's morning. Wouldn't it be great to get up every day and say, good morning, God, what are we doing today? Awesome. So thanks so much for being with us. Thank you again to Stephen Van Cowenberg, the SavvyInvestor.com. Yes. SavvyInvestor.com. I'm the it's savvy, easy, baby. <laughs> we done, but it's awesome and it's savvy. All right, man. Thank so, you so thanks much. Thanks for watching and for listening. And remember, always play full out. Thanks, everybody. What is the Savvy Boot Camp? Are you struggling to get to the next level as a business owner, as an investor? Do you want to multiply your income? Sign up for the Savvy Bootcamp, a strategic and supercharged one night and one day event designed to shortcut your learning process and propel you forward. Just value, no upsells, and an intimate setting to build relationships with like-minded investors. We will be covering how personality profiling can make you a millionaire. Outsourcing and the nitty gritty of maximizing your property management. Scaling your business through systems and automation. Technology hacks you should be using every day. And how to raise private money. Go to www.savvybootcamp.com now 
to register or to find out more. Thanks for listening to the Savvy Radio Show. Glide online and listen to our other motivating episodes at SavvyRadioShow.com. Connect on Twitter at LandlordBook and always be buying assets.